Is it just me, or are these books of the Bible getting longer and longer? So, time to talk about First Kings, which is an appropriate title for this book of the Bible because, well, it's pretty much about kings. It probably ought to be called something like King's Soap Opera, but still, you know, kings. So in the first chapter, King David is having a lot of trouble staying warm. I mean, guy's getting old, pretty elderly. So what they do is they hire a virgin to snuggle him and wait on him. I'm not kidding. They hire this girl, and they get her to, to, to wait on him. But she doesn't fuck him. Assuming that's what no still means anyway. But her name is Abishag, and you'd think someone with shag in their name would be doing the nasty. But apparently not. Well, Adonijah, David's fourth son, thinks that he's going to be king next. And, well, there's other sons, so people start taking sides on who they think is going to be king. Here's a hint. It's not this guy. You see, Nathan starts making all these noises about how David said Solomon was supposed to be king next, and shouldn't something be done about Adonijah? David basically says, whoa, that's just not right. And so he kind of officially like, like stands up with the last of his strength and makes Solomon king. And Adonijah's like, oh crap, I'm going to be killed, aren't I? But David shows him mercy. In chapter 2, David knows that he's dying, so he starts giving Solomon all this advice, like, you know, you better believe in God and stuff, or you'll be in trouble, that kind of thing. And he also warns him about the treachery of people like Joab and other folks. Yeah, because, you know, they're not all the best subjects you ever had. Totally. Now, for whatever reason, Adonijah decides that he wants Dad's nurse to be his wife, so he has his mom talk to Solomon about a betrothal. And for no reason that I can see whatsoever, Solomon has Adonijah killed for this request. Uh, they, seriously, they give no reason whatsoever. It just happens. In fact, Solomon basically starts cleaning house, in essence. He sends men after Joab to kill him. He tells a priest he'll have him killed if he doesn't bear the ark, all kinds of stuff. After a lot of political assassination, he finally feels like he's really the king. You know, comfy in his spot. Now, in chapter 3, I'm not entirely certain if I'm reading this right, but it sounds like Solomon finally makes peace with Egypt and invites Pharaoh's daughter over for a sleepover. Now, Solomon kind of feels insecure about his role as king, and he starts, like, praying to God, and, you know, God appears to him in a dream, and he, he says to God, hey, could you, like, give me the ability to, to read people better so I understand their motivations and stuff, you know, so that I can uh, rule better and, and make this a better land. And God's like, well, you know, you didn't ask me for riches. You didn't ask me for, like, uber power. You asked me for help governing better, for being a better governor. And since that's kind of on the selfless side, yeah, here you go. After that comes the story most of us have already heard about, you know, two women, one live baby, one woman says, hey, that's my baby, the other woman says, that's my baby. Solomon says, bring me a sword, we'll lop the kid in half, and we'll give one half to each is. And the real mom is the one who says, no, 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 don't kill my kid. You've heard it before, I'm sure. The part I want to know, doesn't say in here, is whether or not they were going to cut the kid across the waist or bisect him laterally. Chapter 4 is pretty simple. Uh, Solomon has himself a whole bunch of princes, including a guy named Jehoshaphat, who I assume jumps. I don't know, it's never mentioned in here. And, you know, it talks a lot about his power and, you know, what his ideas for the kingdom are. Well, that's pretty much chapter 4. 5 1 sounds kind of like gay sex. I guess. Uh, I mean, I don't know how to pronounce this one word. Uh, and Hiram, king of Tyre, Tyr, I don't know, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father, for Hiram was ever a lover of David. Aww. So Solomon says, hey, it's a time of peace. We got no one to fight. Hiram, help me build a house to God. I assume a big old temple or something. I mean, you know, a house of God sounds like a church. 
you know, whatever. But point is, he, he says to Hiram, hey, let's build one. And there's a long, long description, multiple chapters of description of this temple that they build and how they build it. I mean, that's chapter 6 and chapter 7. In fact, it says in chapter 7 that it took them 13 freaking years to build this thing. Yeah, uh, it's either huge or they're all thumbs. And he also built a house with a porch in Lebanon for his throne, and another house for his wife, who, if you remember, is one of Pharaoh's daughters. Then he gets Hiram over to build a whole bunch of, like, brass fittings for the place. In fact, Hiram, for a king, does a lot of manual labor in this book. Chapter 8, he has a meeting about how to bring the Ark to his new place. Now, 8, 10 through 11. And it came to pass, when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Sound anyone else like they have themselves a crack then? Or at least a pot pipe? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, these people, they're clearly smoking something. So then Solly, Solomon, basically rehashes David's life for us and talks about how, you know, he's like he built this huge house that was part of David's plan, too, and his plan and all that stuff. But then he gets all insecure about it, and he's like, Ooh, Lord, you are so big. Please bless this house of mine and all that crap. Chapter 8's a long chapter. Let's discuss 837. This will be a cheap shot, mind you. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blasting, mildew, locust, or if there be caterpillar, if there be enemy besieged, blah 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 Oh no, caterpillars! <gasps> of course, I hope there's blasting. I always wanted me a blaster. Just saying. Now we got 841-42 over here. Moreover, concerning a stranger that is not of thy people Israel, but cometh out of a far country for thy name's sake, for they shall hear of thy great name, and of thy strong hand, and of thy stretched out arm, when he shall come and pray toward this house. Now what I want to know is, how is this all-powerful deity not already known everywhere? I mean, people have asked this a lot. I mean, we got people in, like, South American rainforests have never heard of this god guy. Uh, you'd think an all-powerful deity could get known everywhere. Then Solly basically blows God for a little while longer, feeds his ego like you wouldn't believe, before consecrating his temple by sacrificing several thousand head of cattle. Seriously, he goes through herd after herd to, like, you know, make this place sacrosanct or some shit. Man. So, in chapter 9, God basically shows up and says, Yeah, alright, I'll bless this place, no problem. But then he's all, but if any of you betray me, man, you're so fucked. You and your families. And believe me, that comes up a lot later. And when he says, you're all so fucked if you betray me, he means all of you. He says, if, if you, Solomon, betray me, all of Israel is screwed. Okay, so you better be on your best behavior, pal. Then Solomon gives Hiram 20 cities to rule over, and Hiram goes all bitchy. He, he's like, that's not nearly enough. You're not treating me fair, man. 20 cities. Most of us barely rule a single apartment. Come on. Apparently 20 cities just isn't enough for Miss Thing here. Then Solomon builds himself a gigantic navy. Now in chapter 10, we've got ourselves a Queen of Sheba. And she shows up and starts talking to Solomon. She's like asking him question after question, basically interrogating the living crap out of him. But when she's done talking to him, she's like, you're even greater than I heard. Oh my goodness. Wow, that's so cool. But I had to see it for myself. <laughs> then Solomon pretty much covers himself in gold and jewels and wealth. And, you know, I, I kind of thought these religious people were supposed to be humble, but pff, whatever. Now we got 1022 over here, where Solomon basically turns into Michael Jackson. Check it out. For the king had at sea a navy of Tharshish, with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tharshish, bringing gold and silver and ivory and apes and peacocks. Now all we need is like a monkey and the bones of the elephant man over here. Now we got chapter 11, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonites, and Hittites. So, okay, how exactly is he loving them? 
I mean, sounds to me like he's got himself a bit of a harem going on, doesn't it? So now we've got 11-3, which will just confirm what we're talking about harem-wise here. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. 300, 700, I, that's a thousand people for him to have a wee bit of rumpy-pumpy with. I mean, come on, people. Wow. <laughs> Some of us are lucky to have one date. Then Solly's wives start turning him away from Yahweh. They start worshipping other gods and stuff. I'm not entirely sure what a high place is, but Solomon builds one to other gods. Uh, you know, and he's basically just asking for it, because Yahweh's one of those jealous god types. So God basically says to him, Hey, hey, you're betraying me over here. So, you know... Yeah, I'm going to take your kingdom away, but I'm not going to take it away from you, uh-uh. No, I'm going to leave you alone, but your son, your son is fucked. Because <laughs> that's fair. So Hadad the Edomite basically becomes his Lex Luthor, Solomon's Lex Luthor. Rezon, son of Elida, becomes his Darth Vader. It gets pretty nasty. He's got enemies everywhere. Nobody likes Solomon anymore. Solomon tries to kill this Jeroboam guy, and then he reigns for 40 more years and dies. Now then, in chapter 12, Solomon's son Rehoboam becomes king. And then, you know, this Jeroboam guy shows up and tries to persuade him to be nicer than daddy was. So Rebo here basically tells Jerry, uh, go away for a while so I can consult with my wise men, and then come back. You know, because you got to have three days to think it over before you decide whether or not you're going to be nicer to people. Now we've got chapter 12, verse 10. I Listen to this. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make it thou lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. What? Where did that come from? Uh, you know, I haven't seen too many guys naked, but I hope most of them are thicker than that. And not only does he say no, but he threatens them with 1214, and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. <laughs> What is this BDSM crap? Ach wow! Now 12.18 is a little bit confused, but then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee Jerusalem. So as near as I can tell, Rebo here sends a guy out to collect taxes, and the people say, oh, to hell with that, and stone him to death with stones, and Rebo's like, ah, oh, crap, they're going to come after me next, and flees town. Okay. The revolution is on, and they make Jeroboam king. But then God appears to Jerry in a dream and says, no, no, no. I mean, I'm glad you revolted and all, but the line of David has to continue, so, you know, try to get Rebo back, will ya? But then the king, who we find out is still Jerry and not Rebo, uh, f he fashions these two golden calves, which people start to worship. I've never quite understood why a yellow cow is something you go om to, but apparently they do. Now in chapter 13, this prophet comes along and says, there'll be a kid named Josiah and he'll be the next king. Now, why this won't make people start naming their kid Josiah in the hope of winning the lottery, I don't know, but <laughs> there you go. So King Jerry does not like this at all, and he basically invites the prophet over and raises his hand to it, and the prophet goes, yeah, yeah, shrivel, and his hand, like, shrivels up, right? And so King Jerry's like, eh, buddy, pal, come here, claw, come here and stay with me, and we'll be pals, just make the claw better, will ya? And the prophet says, no. So he takes off, and this older prophet goes back after him, and, uh, you know, the younger prophet is like, hey, you know, God basically told me not to come back, and the older prophet goes, no, 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 I got a message, and it is okay to be come back, come on, come on, let's go, and so the younger prophet does go back, and, well, trouble ensues, because God waves a hand at the older prophet and says, yeah, you're getting eaten by a lion, dude. 
which, you know, happens. Oops. So in chapter 14, Abijah, the son of Jerry, Jeroboam, gets sick. And Jeroboam, for, for no reason I can see, he basically says to his wife, Hey, honey, dress up as a peasant and go talk to this one prophet dude to find out what'll happen. But the prophet, like, recognizes her right away, so what the hell was the point of the disguise? It doesn't say. In fact, God warns the prophet and says, hey, it's actually Jerry's wife. And then God says to the wife, hey, you people have basically turned away from me, so your son is doomed. Sorry. So Jerry dies, his son dies, but he has, has another son named Nadab, who basically takes up the mantle anyway. So, uh, you know, I mean, okay, losing a child's gotta suck, but what was the big deal? His line continues. So apparently Rebo, Rehoboam, uh, is ruling in Judah. I have no idea where Judah is, but apparently it's not Israel, or it's, what, a tiny part of Israel? really doesn't say in here. But they start turning away from God, worshipping evil, you know, next verse, same as the first. Then Egypt comes in and takes all of their treasure and kicks their butt, and Rebo's son Abijam becomes the next king after Rebo dies. Then in chapter 16, Abijam dies too, and his son Asa takes over and decides he's going to clean up the place and bring the church back according to all the xenophobic and homophobic rules of this Yahweh guy. A dude named Basha kills Nadab and takes over Israel, and then he and, like, Israel and Judah, him and Asa fight for the rest of their lives until finally Asa dies. The rest of chapter 15 gets really confusing. It's very tangled. I mean, one guy rules, and then another guy dies, and then these guys fight, and then someone else gets killed, and they take over, and blah, 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 blah. It's very tangled without a lot of, like, linear shit going on, and a lot of unpronounceable names. But in the end, well, things essentially end up like they always were. Couple of kingdoms, couple of kings. Some people worshiping God, some people not. On to chapter 16. Now we've got chapter 16, where a bunch of people I've never heard of, who are sons of people I've never heard of, start ruling, you know, all these other places we've been hearing about. And we've got this guy named Hanani, uh, who had a son named Jehu. And Jehu was like, you know, the new king of Israel, I think. It's really hard to untangle. This place is a, I mean, th this section of the book is a complete mess. But... God basically shows up and says, Gee, uh, you've really made me angry. I'm going to have to smite you and your people. So sorry. Then Basha dies, and his son Elah assumes the throne. But his chariot leader, Zimri, uh, starts plotting against him, basically. Zimri sneaks up on Elah while he's drunk and sleeping, and pfft, kills him and assumes the throne. Also, kills off every family member. And from the sound of it, God approves. But the people decide that Zimri is far too much of a traitor, murderer, assassin type guy, and so they appoint this guy Omri to be king instead. They all go take over the city of Terza, and Zimri, realizing he's lost public opinion, basically sets fire to his house and then pulls it down on top of him, committing suicide. Boy, talk about not being able to deal well with failure, right? But Israel was still divided. Omri had an, a rival or an enemy called Tibri. They fight. Omri wins, he becomes king. But of course, Omri starts to mess up, God doesn't like him anymore, thinks he's evil, all this stuff, and so eventually he dies, and his son Ahab rises to the throne. But of course, Ahab messes up too, starts worshipping Baal, and you know, God doesn't really care for that. So in chapter 17, a guy named Elijah shows up and tells Ahab, hey, it's not gonna rain unless I make it happen. God gave me this power. Now, the Bible has this really annoying tendency to mention two characters by name, but then after that all it does is talk about one character with a bunch of pronouns, and you have no idea which the hell character they're talking about. But eventually you find out that it was Elijah who sneaks off to this brook and drinks brook water and is fed food by ravens, for whatever reason. But it's not for several paragraphs that we find out that's Elijah, who then has this conversation with God after a couple of days, telling him to go to this city called Zarephath, and he goes and meets this woman who's outside collecting sticks. This woman's a widow, and Elijah says to her, Hey, would you, like, fetch me some water and some food? 
And the widow says, but uh, I don't have any. I can barely afford to feed myself and my son, let alone you. And Elijah, like a bad televangelist, says to her, Ha ha, go out and cook the food that you do have. But first, bring me some cake. Because if you do, God will reward you with more food than you can possibly imagine. Thing is, unlike in real life, it works. Then the widow's son gets sick, and Elijah prays over the kid and heals him. And the woman goes, Ooh, truly you are a wondrous prophet. Now in chapter 18, God tells Elijah to go to Ahab and say, Hey, I'm going to make it rain. And who knows, maybe there'll be a white whale or something, huh? No, wait, wrong Ahab. Apparently there'd been a bit of a famine, and Obadiah, who's like Ahab's houseboy or something, is hiding a bunch of prophets in a cave and sneaking them food every now and then. Doesn't really say why, just that he's doing it. Now, Ahab tells Obi to go out and find some grass for the horses, and while he's doing that, Obi happens to bump into Elijah, and Elijah's like, Obadiah, my old friend. Now, Obadiah, knowing Elijah's rep, is like, ooh, humana, 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 you're back, yay, whatever shall we do, right? Elijah says, hey, announce my return to Ahab, okay, let, let him know I'm back. And Obadiah's like, are, are you kidding? He, he'll kill me. I mean, he hates you. And Elijah's all, don't worry, I'll be right behind you. I'll be there. Don't worry, just tell him, he won't hurt you, trust me. So Obi goes to Ahab and says, hey, Elijah's back, uh, you want to go talk to the guy? And, you know, um, Elijah and Ahab get together, and Ahab's like, what are you doing back? You're trouble, kiddo. And Elijah's like, I'm not trouble, you're trouble, because you've stopped worshiping God, and that's why you've got this drought and famine and shit going on. So Elijah suggests this contest kind of thing, a weird sort of version of America's Funniest People or possibly American Idol, but Israeli. The way it works is this. Elijah says, hey, let's all get our people together. And we got the worshipers of Baal on one side. And then we got the worshipers of Yahweh on the other. And we all take a cow. And we slaughter the cow. And we build a wooden altar. And we put pieces of cow meat on the altar. And then what we do is we call upon our God to light the altar and barbecue the cow. I'm sure you can see where this is going. Basically, what ends up happening is that Yahweh lights the cow on fire, Baal does not, oh, and everyone starts going, yeah, all right, uh, I guess we'll worship Yahweh. Fine, whatever. Ahab's not too happy about this, and so he goes off to some place called Jezreel to, I don't know, mope or something. You'll find out later he's quite the whiny little bitch. And for some reason, Elijah follows him. That's the end of chapter 19. Now, they never really say it in chapter 20, but apparently Ahab gets over it, and he decides to go back and rule, because this Syrian king, Ben-Hadad, shows up and says, Oh, uh, Ahab, by the way, uh, all your gold and your silver and your jewels and shit and your women and your children, yeah, they belong to me now. And Ahab goes, uh, okay. Yeah, he just gives up. What a pussy. Now all the elders tell Ahab to stop being such a wuss, and Ben-Hadad gets ready to, you know, attack, and this angel shows up and tells Ahab, hey, um, actually, if you do what we tell you, you're gonna win. And he's like, oh, so, yeah. Now, fortunately for Ahab, it turns out that, you know, Ben-Hadad's guys, like his leaders and stuff, his commanders, they all have this binge drinking night, and so he's able to slaughter the army easily because they're just plain not prepared. Ben-Hadad actually gets away, but they win that particular battle. Then there's this weirdness about the gods of the mountains and the gods of the valleys, <laughs> whatever, but... Israel comes in and, you know, kicks butt and wins, of course, because these are the good guys in this book. And as I say, Ben-Hadad had escaped the initial slaughter, and he puts himself underground in this bunker, you know, to try and hide from the resulting slaughter in his town. But all of his advisors are like, dude, okay, here's what you do. You disguise yourself as a peasant, and you get the hell out of town. You know, that, that's the best way to do it. They won't notice a peasant. Don't worry about it. But it doesn't really work. 
because they notice him and they go, aha, Ben, gotcha. And he's like, oh, mercy, mercy, mercy. And they go, tell you what, we'll give you mercy if you return all the shit you stole and give us your lands. And he does. And he goes away. That's it. No harm, no foul, apparently. Then there's this really weird moment where one of the prophets gets it into his head to go up to a soldier and says, hey, dude, um, smite me. And the soldier's like, well, I'm not going to smite you. Why would I do that? And, you know, the, the prophet goes, well, all right, but uh, a lion's going to eat you. So one does. And then the prophet goes up to another soldier and says, dude, smite me. And the soldier says, uh, all right, shwink, and smites him, right? Gives him a flesh wound. And then the, the prophet, like, dirties himself up with rags and dirt and ashes and shit. And he goes up to Ahab, the king, and says, hey, uh, can you help a guy in need? And Ahab's like, no, fuck off. Get away from me, you filthy peasant, right? And the, the prophet takes off his disguise and says, ha-ha, I was testing you and you failed. You're not generous like you're supposed to be. So Ahab flunked that test hardcore and ends up cursed for it. Now then, on to chapter 21, where there's a guy named Naboth who has a vineyard right next to uh, Ahab's house, which I assume is a palace, but it doesn't say. It just says his house, right? And Ahab wants that vineyard to plant some other crop or something, so he tries to offer this Naboth guy a, uh, a better vineyard, an actually genuinely better vineyard in a different place, uh, you know, in exchange. But Naboth is like, no, this is the ancestral land of my, my family, given to us by God. I'm not allowed to leave. Now, for the first time, we're told that Jezebel is a woman, and it turns out she's also Ahab's wife. And she hears about this because Ahab turns into a complete despondent little brat about it. You know, doesn't eat anymore, cries on his bed, all because he didn't get his way. And Jezebel's like, I gotta do something about this. So what Jezebel does is she has this Naboth guy framed for blasphemy and has him killed, basically, has him stoned for blasphemy, and, you know, then takes his vineyard, goes to Ahab and says, dude, I got your white will, I mean your vineyard, here it is. Yeah. Now this cheers Ahab up, but Elijah hears the news, and, and uh, God hears about it, and tells Elijah to go investigate, and when Elijah finds out what happens, well, he's not too kind to Ahab about that. He says, God's gonna curse you for this one, for sure. In fact, he says that his entire family line, Ahab's entire family line, is cursed for this, and Jezebel is going to be eaten by dogs. And Ahab tries to live like a bum to repent, and God goes, Oh, all right, you're off the hook, but I'm going to punish your son. Which is, you know, fair. Now in chapter 22, we have three years of peace with Syria, which is great because these guys have been fighting almost nonstop for the vast majority of the book, right? And we get the king of Judah named Jehoshaphat, who I assume jumps at some point, but it's not mentioned in here. Uh, he, he goes to the king of Israel, and it doesn't say, for the longest time it doesn't say, I had to like do a lot of backtracking to find out that, yeah, it's still Ahab. But he goes to him and says, hey, uh, you know, I got a plan. He says, I'd like to take this place called Ramoth Gilead from the Syrians, and let's go consult a couple of prophets to find out if it'll go well for us. When Jehoshaphat suggests talking to a prophet of God, Ahab is like, no, please no, that guy hates me, he keeps predicting disaster for me, I don't want to talk to him at all. Let's consult some of the other prophets. And Jehoshaphat's actually horrified. He's like, hey, you can't talk that way about a prophet of God. <gasps> but, uh, you know, they decide to consult him anyway. So the king calls Micaiah, the prophet of Yahweh, and bunches of other prophets for gods they do not name in here, and asks them, how's this going to go for us? All of the prophets are like, oh man, this is going to be awesome. Even Micaiah says, yeah, you're going to do great. But when pressed, Micaiah's like, all right, all right, I'm just going with the crowd. Yeah, you're fucked. He's all, this is going to end badly for you, and dogs will be licking up your blood. <sighs> Which is kind of creepy, but whatever. And the king's all, see, see, he hates me, I'm telling ya. And they still haven't said who the king is. I had to backtrack like a mofo to find out it was still Ahab. So King Ahab says, hey, lock this Micaiah guy up until we get back. And Micaiah says, hey, I'm a prophet, you're not coming back. 
Then Ahab disguises himself as Jehoshaphat, I guess to avoid being identified as Ahab, to avoid the prophecy, I guess. And, you know, all of the people that are meant to attack Ahab go after Jehoshaphat. But they notice that it's not really him, and they're like, oops. Then a bowman gets a lucky shot in on Ahab, and, you know, plants a good one on him. And eventually, over time, Ahab bleeds out and dies on his chariot. When they clean off his chariot later, dogs come by to lick up the blood, thus fulfilling the prophecy. Then Jehoshaphat wins the battle, goes home, commits a kind of xenophobic genocide against the Sodomites, and then later dies. Ahab's son Ahaziah takes over and ends up worshipping Baal, further pissing off Yahweh. The end. You know, the more of this book I read, the more I don't really see the point. It's as much a history book as it is a lesson about the tenets of the religion and, you know, why you should believe in God and all this stuff. I mean, most of it just seems to be like cautionary tales. If you don't believe in God, you'll lose the war, be poisoned or burned alive or something. I mean, there isn't a lot in here about theology. It's mostly just history plus, you know, fantasy about gods. Which, for my money, is not what I expected from the Bible. But, I don't know, maybe it gets into more of that stuff later. We'll see. Uh, Second Kings is up next. I hope it's not quite as dull as this was. This took me quite a while to read it. But, until next time, this is Bionic Dance, reading the Bible, so you don't have to.